Well, we have a very loyal following with Orpheus, and we want to make it grow, of course, and we need more marketing and that sort of thing. But I think people that know about it like it very much. Yvonne said, Jacques, can you write an opera for us? I don't want to write an opera, but were I to write an opera, it would be something that would make no sense. But at the end of the performance, the audience would have had an aesthetic experience. So there are all kinds of compositional artifices that one indulges in that makes the piece. Since it's to be about nothing, obviously finding a text was impossible. So I did a lot of experimentation. I made a, a grid of phonemes from the brightest, pho brightest sounding phonemes. They started in the upper left-hand corner of the grid and went through all different sounds and the darkest phonemes are located at the lower right-hand part of the grid, grid. And from that I created words and sentences, if you wish. And uh, that accounted for the, the verbal structure of the piece. And for this piece, I made three different languages from the, this grid. One for Ivor, who begins the singing. One for Irgo, who uh, is the second part. And as they gradually get together, the two languages gradually mix and then becomes a third language to finish the piece. Now the piece itself, is a rather rigorous construction. It's in six parts, and there are many interrelationships between the parts. For example, in the prologue, you see uh, people walking around the stage, playing wiros and sp speaking sounds, like uh, uh, labial sounds, and then consonants. This comes back at the very end of the piece in the epilogue, where Rather than the random pattern of the opening six musicians, there are the two musicians walking in a very strict pattern, and the sound of the wiro is in the instrumental ensemble. And uh, that's so that you can see the my beginning is my end in one sense. And the piece is folded back and forth in too many levels to describe in any great detail. Except, I will say that Ebor's basic chord is, is a three note chord, and Ergo's uh, basic chord is a, the inversion of that up an octave. And at the end in the epilogue, they're joined together, and they're unified, and it becomes the basic sound of the epilogue. We decided this season to do something more ambitious than we've ever done. Although we've brought the El Cimarron Ensemble over in their entirety once, and, and Yvonne and Christina, another time for a duo concert, uh, to bring them over to do rehearsals on this level to premiere a new piece of this level of complexity required uh, a higher financial and logistical level of involvement than we've done with any concert that we've done in the past. We made the decision that to keep the group together in one place would actually be a time saver as opposed, even though it was an hour's drive from where I live in the mountains to the rehearsal hall, that to have them all in one place and get them out the door at the same time was going to save time. And to save money and hopefully have them have more fun and create a better atmosphere, we had all of our meals together for the last six days. Um, they were rehearsing, we brought food down and we broke and we had lunch. Uh, and if not, we ate and watched the sunset and rehearsed every minute that we could in between. I think that in one of his, you know, primary tools is metric modulation, and I think that um, was pretty heavily represented in this piece. I think he's done not that much work with voice. Um, and I think that his playing with voice as a sound and not as a communication device. Although it was interesting, after the concert, many people said, well, I think I heard some German there. Well, no, I believe I heard some French. And I think maybe that's the more of the nothing and more. And I think that skewing perception 
uh, was something that I haven't really seen him play around with before. And I think maybe that was what he was getting at. I know in many ways he saw this as the most important thing he's ever done. El Cimarron is a piece by Hans Werner Henze, German composer, who unfortunately passed away two years ago. It's about an escaped slave in Cuba in the, in the late 18th century. He started this project in 1999. Uh, it was a big success from the beginning, and so we decided to perform more and more El Cimarron. And even more, we decided to form a group for, forever, which uh, devotes himself to contemporary music theater in small size, which means not more than six, seven people, usually four, in order to be able to travel easily and to bring, bring these pieces also in small communities with less money and so not, not to, to remain a privilege for the rich in the cities. And things should be a challenge for us. So, so if, if, if you feel challenged, um, then we are happy. The first of all, the group is democratically organized. Everybody has one man, one voice, one woman, one voice. We decide together which piece, where to perform, and which guests we shall invite. And um, so I'm a member of the ensemble, like each other. And this is special with our group also, because uh, the musicians are not in the pit or hidden somewhere. They are part of the show. So act active part of the show, so they have to do the actions and to uh, interfere or to communicate with, this, with the singers on stage. He wrote situations of music and the singers are now humans. So, and the singers have to deal with musical situations which may cause emotions, but not necessarily and which lead to ancient worlds, which we don't know anymore. So it's very archaic in one way, and very modern in the other way. So the electronic file that comes in leads us to future times or, or out of the world areas. We try actually to respect not telling a story, and we don't tell a story in the end, but we actually do a theater that leads the audience to a certain point. I happened to hear El Cimarron, uh, a recording, uh, with Leo Brauer, who is also a very famous guitarist and composer, and I was very impressed by that. And then I got to know Michael, and I started <laughs> thinking and combining both things, and, and I happened to have this idea, yeah, to to put the group together. So we did one, one month of rehearsing at the beginning, and we played it three times. And afterwards, after some months, I think we had the opportunity to pre present it also at the Salzburg Festival, at the opening of the Salzburg Festival. This was a, not a very, very important step. This is a fascinating piece. <laughs> it's great because it, yeah, it, it, it plays with many very subtle details. It also uses electronic music. Uh, it's very demanding for us. It's incredibly difficult. <laughs> I nearly got a tendinitis practicing it <laughs> on my instrument. It's really, um, it's a really hard piece. But yeah, I love it. And Jack invented this kind of universal language. So you don't understand the text. It's all just invented by him. And it's got very, I mean, it's all about emotions somehow, mm. about different times, future, past times, ancient cultures. It's a great mix, very mysterious, and I've never heard anything like that, yeah. It's a great invention. El Cimarron Ensemble is just a great possibility to grow up this idea because we are not too many people. Normally we are just percussion, guitar, flute, one singer, baritone, and Michel Kessen as a uh, stage, uh, stage director. So 
five people, it's easy to, to, to speak and to find a solution for everything. We work a lot on everything, but anyway, the idea is that we can do it in the easy way. Also in the big theater or in the little theater with a lot of light or with l something which, is, which help a little bit. But the idea is to be very flexible. And this is also very important. As a percussionist, if you want to have a little bit more, uh, let's say, if you don't want to play just timpani, power, uh, yeah, you have to, if you want to play marimba or vibraphone or a little bit more music, you need to go in the direction of the avant-garde. It's very difficult. He did a great job, but sometimes nearly impossible to play. So I, we were working a lot, also in Europe, we were working a lot without Jack. I mean, we were working with another uh, as assistant conduct, uh, conductor, and we did a lot of a lot of job, to, a lot of work together. There, are, there is a lot of emotion inside, and Jack can 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 work very good on it, and he can. I mean, we can have a good reaction. That's great. Of course, is uh, sometimes is we are tired and it's e uh, not not easy to 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 come from Cali from uh, Fresno here. But we use this time to speak together and to decide what we have to do next time. Well, the El Cimarron Ensemble is doing um, contemporary theater, so opera most of the time, and. The El Cimarron piece itself, from written by Hans Werner Henze, is yeah the main piece of our ensemble, or the the reason probably why we play together. <laughs> and afterwards, we had a lot of composers who got inspired by this piece, I guess, and that's why they wrote for us for this uh, yeah kind of instrumentation, yeah. That's a wonderful thing in doing chamber music uh, or music in general. Uh, you can be very flexible and yeah, it's a really, really beautiful piece. First of all, there's a lot of different emotions in there. Yeah, it makes sense more and more uh, in playing together. For me, it's like a puzzle and at the beginning you're just playing your part or uh, practicing your part and uh, it's sometimes, yeah, confusing or, and sometimes it really makes sense but it's it's like a, a mixture and then we played together the instrumental part which was still yeah it was simply not completed of course yeah singers are missing and with the singers when the singers joined in uh, it made more and more sense and uh, every single emotion you can really enjoy and you can simply try to express it, to, to bring it to the audience in the end, yeah. to speak somehow. I heard some sounds of this um, computer sounds and I was really, yeah, I think, oh, it's, it's, it's cool. And then here I heard uh, all this with really instruments and, and our voices together and it's, it's cool. It's really, wow, it's, it's big emotion, I think. I think it's much more interesting than classical music, you, you find some ways and yeah, it's like another cosmos or something, yeah, I love it. <laughs> because I think for me as a, as a singer, it's a, it's a big chance to find out something and yeah, it's a new world and I want to jump in and find something and no, no person uh, before I do this and it's, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's feeling like a power fly or something. <laughs> because I'm, it's new for me this music, and uh, the, the the new language I like it really much. I like this shamat I I dream about this, yeah, and <laughs> I think I I will put it in my life more, <laughs> and um, yeah, it's 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 crazy for me to um, find a point where is my standing in this uh, learning. Uh, project. Yeah? I'm. I'm not sure here or I'm here, but I think it. It will become with all together. 
I find my way and then it will works. <laughs> I think the reaction is more or less the same. So the, the, the only difference is if you have an audience which is not familiar with contemporary music, then you have a big difference. But uh, for example, you can do an introduction and people will easily enjoy it. So, well, we had a great time. Yeah. Great host with Brad and Ellie, great truth, nice and mild weather if you compare it to Switzerland. Great venue, great composer, and hopefully also great performance. I like a lot the structure, so the symmetrical architecture, and I like especially the final section for its more contemporary like mood and a very poetic setup. I think Orpheus offers an entirely different genre of music, and one that I, I welcome an opportunity to, to hear myself. And I want to think one that I think that really serves Fresno in offering a, a variety of pre presentations. No two Orpheus presentations or sessions are alike, and they, the opportunity is forthcoming with uh, this coming Saturday. I think with the Cimarron from Austria, it's going to be a spectacular opportunity for us to see Orpheus really shine. You know, the combination of chair uh, music and innovative programming is, makes, makes a lot of sense. I encourage both, both ends of the spectrum in terms of uh, music, but Orpheus is certainly part of it.
My name is Robert Ware. I'm a retired professor of scene design and associate dean of arts and humanities and uh, was charged with putting together and designing the Honors College here. So uh, what did I think of this evening's performance? I thought it was liberating, uh, levitating. I thought it took us off of the floor and somehow uh, the music and the performance itself uh, brought us into a space that was not grounded in any world I know. And I think that's good. Um, I had one regret, and that was that I felt that the lighting that was chosen for uh, the male character uh, was uh, killed the color of his costume, which was black. And I understand that the goal was that it was to be black at the beginning and then somewhere which would be revealed as being that very rich purple that we saw in the um, cur curtain call. But um, this was, I think, of all the works that I've experienced of Jack Fortner's over the past 37 years, I think it's been that long, since 1978, um, I think this is the most extraordinary work he's ever done. I'm deeply pleased to have seen it. I only wish that it had been repeated tonight after a bit of cocktails. I'm gonna have one now. <laughs> My name is Celeste Johnston, and I was a costume designer for the piece. Um, I got involved when a friend of mine said that her father, Jack, needed a customer, and I jumped at the chance. I asked him what he needed, and he told me, and he sent me uh, music for the piece, and I was fascinated. And he sent me the pieces simply so that I could get an idea of the um, mysticism of the piece so you could get in so I could be involved with that, that have that in my creation process. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, I costume because I love to costume and I love to create and work with actors and bring the whole vision onto the stage. My only regret is I never get to see my costumes on stage because I'm always working in the back making sure that everything is going just so. Because I always think the goal is to make my characters, my actors look beautiful and comfortable and creative and I'm always back there trying to facilitate that. I love avant-garde music which is what I would characterize this as and I just was, I was captivated even backstage looking and listening. Um. You know, one of the things that I did all this week was deliberately avoid being in the rehearsal so that I could react as an audience member. But <clears throat> I caught enough glimpses of it that I was kind of spinning in an odd direction because as a composer, uh, I was thinking about different things. And I've always been fascinated by the role of ritual in music and music as ritual dating back to the days when I was very young that I uh, sang Palestrina Masses in a choir and, and did it as part of a Renaissance Fair high mass with the incense censers swinging and priests in long robes and music of Harry Parch and, and I, I was really struck by the sense of, of magic and ritual in the music. Um, I think that was the, the most powerful impact that it had on me. New music uh, adds new colors to the palette. Um, go back a hundred years and look at, at Schoenberg and his experimentations. Maybe nobody's really directly doing that now, but he liberates the, the colors of the composer's palette in a way that that couldn't have happened without him. So only time will tell which colors from this will become in the, in the new set of paints that we can use as composers. Uh, but I think that taking those risks alone is validity enough. I hope it continues to be a vital and important uh, feature of the Central California music scene. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful because I'm actually leaving at the end of this season and I, I hope that 
one of my big goals was to take it away from the idea that a personality is what drove it and that it became an operational system. And I put a lot of time and effort into that, developing that system. And I guess we'll find out whether my system will hold water or, or not. But um, I'm highly hopeful that it will continue to thrive and be an important part of Central California's music. Jack Fortner, he provides an inspiration, uh, uh, motive power, which is, is so essential for us. Uh, so Orpheus' future is, is, is clearly, my, my way of looking, uh, dependent upon Jack's future. Uh, well, uh, I think Orpheus is totally dependent on Jack. That there would be Orpheus without Jack, and I'm not sure that um, if Jack decided to stop, that it would continue. Uh, I mean, that's something that, as a board, we have to really think about seriously at some point. Uh, I mean, uh, musicians, I think, are happy to continue playing, but organizing concerts and programs and uh, doing all of the things. That Jack and Brad have been doing are, are you know, take a, a lot of time and energy. And, uh, I mean, the board is able to help out a little, but, but uh, uh, not to the extent that, that is required. So it really does require some thought about what happens in the future.